welcome to the Presbyterian Church in Westfield. We are glad to have you with us. You know, today we will be worshiping together and praying. We will celebrate communion together. So at this time, I invite you to go and grab whatever bread or cup is, you know, of your choice to celebrate today. In addition to that, you know, many of us have been, let's just say, sensing that there is a yearning to get back to normal, even as we face an uncertain future. There are questions about how to take the next step, how to live in this new moment that we have. And if any of this resonates with you at all, stay with us, because today we are continuing our summer worship experience inspired by ancient and really biblical sports metaphors. So let's review for just a moment. You see, St. Paul lived in a world where sports or athletic competition was used in religious festivals throughout Rome and Greece. And celebrating that pinnacle of human physical achievement went hand in hand with celebrating our worth as humans and measuring our ethics, our morals. But Paul is up to something different. He used these very same phrases to point us back to Christ, to understand the work of God in every aspect of our lives, and also to remind us that we're not alone. So join us now as we get back in the game.
there are some people in our lives that we look for. I mean, I can remember when I first started out in ministry, I was a student pastor at the Brick Church up in New York City. I was so nervous that my knees always felt weak whenever I led worship. And I constantly felt like I was about to just trip and and fall down the marble steps, either really actually over my clumsy feet and more often over my clumsy tongue. I thought I was just terrified that I was going to mess something up. But out in the congregation, out amongst the people, I would look up and I would look for my soon-to-be brother-in-law and his family. They were a safe place for me. They were a safe place for me, especially when I was unsure of myself. And the same thing happened in every single church to follow. In Newport News, Virginia, in Virginia Beach, Virginia, also in Buckhead and Atlanta. And the same thing happened right here in this church, the Presbyterian Church in Westfield, when I first started. Sure enough, there were people out in the congregation who became my safe space. I've heard from several pastors, including our own parish associate, Tom Court, call these people our balcony people. These are the people we look for. (laughs) When I was a kid growing up in Texas, you played football. Even if you, like me, had no business playing football, you played the sport. In fact, there was really actually no other sport in the entire state. There was football, and then there were off-season sports. These were mere games that were played to keep athletes healthy and conditioned when we were not communing with the most holy pigskin. (laughs) My mother sat in the seats. She sat up in those stands each and every single game, faithful to the last. And of course, she sat as close as she possibly could to the ambulance, convinced that I was only, it was always only just a matter of time until I was going to be rushed off to the hospital. I always knew where to find her because of that. I would look up into the stands close to where the ambulance was, knowing, hoping for, but also just knowing, trusting she was in it with me to the end. Everyone, everyone needs people just like this, be it family members, trusted confidants, mentors, someone that we can look to and look for in a moment of need. Each one of us needs people who are in it with us, who share in our ups and our downs, who live the thrill of our wins just as they live out the bitterness of our own defeats and everything in between. At its heart, that is a piece of what I think is going on in today's scripture. It's not a story per se, but it points back to every single one of us and the stories that are part of our own lives. So let's hear it now. This comes from the letter to the Hebrews, or just Hebrews, chapter 12. It's the very beginning of the first verse, and then we stop, we pause, and we come back to verses 14 through 17. So St. Paul, or whomever it is that's the writer of this, says the following. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely. It goes on. Pursue peace with everyone. Pursue peace with everyone and the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and through it may become defiled. See to it that no one becomes like Esau, an immoral and godless person who sold his birthright for a single meal. You know that later, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent even though he sought the blessing with tears. There you have it. We suffer and we toil. We have ups and we have downs. We have lessons learned. And because of this, we are surrounded, and because that we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, we are supported. We are held. We are encouraged. We are perhaps less likely to trip over ourselves along the way. 
And the second part of our passage today, the second part of it, gets into some things that on the surface might even sound odd. And I think it's, it's worthwhile diving into that a little bit. Basically, everything that happens in today's little passage after us being surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses is basically a warning. The original intent was to remain peaceful and pure or else. The idea was that if we don't stick to the path or run the race with perseverance, like we heard last week, we're at risk of tripping right on out of the grace of God. The writer of this letter beats up on old Esau to try to make the point, claiming that Esau was this godless person who gave away his whole life for, uh, I don't know, a convenience, losing everything and being left in agony. Fooey. Pogwash. Now, I know that every single person who's going to listen to this already knows the story of Esau. But let's just review it so that you can impress your friends, you know, those godless ones that don't know these stories. You see, Jacob and Esau are brothers in Genesis, in the first book of the Bible. And their relationship in some ways actually mimics uh, the conflicts that we see in Cain and Abel, you know, famous for one killing the other. But in this story, however, Jacob is this pesky younger child who uses his guile to steal what truly belongs to his big brother, right on down to their father's blessing. He even had his mom helping the whole way. She literally turns her back on one child to favor the other. It's victim blaming, if you ask me. It's victim blaming to the point at any time that we would point the finger, right? At Esau, you see, Jacob is a thief. Now, he is a thief who is favored by God, who is seemingly blessed, but a thief nonetheless. In the end, however, Esau is largely left alone. No one is in his corner. No one is in his stands. He has no balcony people. No one's looking out for Esau, and it tore his world apart. If you ask me, the world needs us, this cloud of witnesses, right, to support, to cheer on, to give hope. The fact is, the world can be a pretty lonely place, a dark place even. People that have a spiritual life, people of faith, they can, they're not always, but they can. They have the ability to be a light for that dark place, offering hope. There are a whole lot of people out there with no one to turn to, no one sitting in the stands to support them. I think that St. Paul, whomever it is that actually wrote that ancient letter to the Hebrews, that person wanted to help people understand how to live out their faith. Because we are so, you know, because we are so surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, we are now empowered to become just that a cloud of witnesses for other people. So how do we go about it? Well, don't worry, because this writer, this author, goes on. Like we heard in the, in the telling itself, in verses 14 through 17, we're told to pursue peace with everyone. That's the starting point. That's the cornerstone of the whole argument. Pursue peace. Live a life that is set apart. Another way of saying it would be holy. Or special. I think that's a great way of talking about it. Make sure that no one fails to get the grace of God. Prevent bitterness from ruling the day. I mean, yes, I guess I would put it like this. Love people, especially when they least deserve it. Try to keep the peace. Offer grace more than it's deserved. Become someone that others can trust with the big stuff. What does that look like? What does that look like, I wonder? Well, to be honest, and I hope I'm not being trite with this because I I don't believe that I am, I think I saw it recently. In the shuffle of all the crazy of daily life these days, we have the additional chaos uh, of the Tokyo Olympics. And a lot of people have had a lot to say in the last several days about 
Simone Biles, a gymnast. In her own way, I think she did for her team what we might be called to do for the world. I think there is a connection between what she did this past week. And don't worry if you don't know, I'll get to it. But I think there's a connection between what she did this past week and what we are called to do as people of faith, especially in being there for others, being a support for others, being someone others can rely on. It didn't happen in an obvious way. The way that we may have expected for Simone Biles, who is arguably the greatest gymnast in, you know, at least in recent memory, she was supposed to be the anchor, the person who performed the best, who was flawless, on whom everyone else rested and trusted and didn't have to necessarily do it themselves. She was going to lead them to victory, and it didn't happen that way. Instead, this week, Simone realized that she was not in a position to help her team that way. And so she moved from being the person who led from the front to being the person the team could trust for support. I think she did for her team what we are being called to do for all the world, especially for the lonely people in our lives. Health restrictions have meant that Simone's family, who usually are there for every single one of these gymnastics meets, have remained back in the United States. And the usual buzz that happens up in the stands have been replaced largely with a vacuum of an almost empty venue. And with all the pressure that this young woman has riding on her own shoulder, she looks up in the stands and there's not a single friendly face. She looks to the sands and there's a hole. There is a gaping hole where her family should be. There is no safe space. She's hanging out there on her own. Now, is she rattled? Is it a case of the yips to use athletic parlance? I'm going to speak really frankly here, but the loudest voices in media and social media uh, complaining about her and what she's done, none of them have ever com competed ever at the level that she has, and they have no right to speak. This tremendous athlete looks into the stands. Every pattern that she uses and has to be able to feel connected to her sport, to prepare, to have the pace and the place and the way in which she does what she does, it's all gone. There is no safe space. She has no balcony people. But did she retreat back home to the United States, catching an early flight? Did she go back simply to the athlete, you know, the athlete dorms to go be on her cardboard bed by herself? No. She came alongside her teammates, cheering them on, holding them up, being the one that they could look to as they achieved more on their own. She did the hard thing. And in a confusing moment, she stood with them, cheering them on. You know, more and more people are wanting to get back to life, to get back in the game. If we want to be the kind of person that, that gets trusted, if we want to be that kind of person who becomes a support for other people, we have got to get out of the stands. We have to stop being viewers of the action, and we have to get into the action. We have to become someone that someone else looks for, for comfort and for security, for the strength to keep going on. What you have gone through in your life, what you have survived even in the past 16 months of this pandemic, your life can give hope to other people. It can be a lifeline for someone else. Now, now is our time to come down from the stands to stand with those who don't know where to turn. This is your moment.
My name is Diane Hansen, and I'm on the Zambia mission team. In 2017, I, along with other adults and youth, went to visit our sister church in Livingstone, Zambia. It was a life-changing experience for me. The people are so poor in material goods, but they are so rich and strong in their faith. We got to know them. We talked, we listened, we hugged, we prayed, we sang, we danced. And mostly we learned about their unwavering strength in their faith and in God. We've supported these friends over many years, helping them to build a church, helping them uh, to with funds so that they could carry out their own missions. Since the pandemic, the situation in Zambia has become dire. Their currency is devalued. They've lost jobs, they face food insecurity, and they have a lack of a viable water source for their church, their church school, and their boarding house. We are doing a fundraiser to provide funds for a board hall that would give them clean and reliable water and to also for micro loans. So that would empower them. If you feel called to make a donation to help these dear people, please do so and note that it is for Zambia. One of my favorite hymns is, Here I Am, Lord, is it? I, Lord, and it says, I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you lead me. I will hold your people in my heart. I pray that each one of you will hold our dear partners and friends in Zambia in your heart. Thank you. Whether or not you're a first-time guest or a long-time member, whether you are a part of the group that worships online live every single week, or you find us on one of the platforms for a more timeless connection, you belong right here. Welcome home, my friend. You know, whenever we pray, it can be on our own, it can be at stoplights, it can be in groups, small groups. You know, prayer is never really just only about us and what's going on in our own lives or in the lives of the people that we care about. Whenever we pray, we encourage, especially here in this kind of service, for everyone involved to share what is weighing on their spirits so that we can make your prayers our prayers. It is something that we get to do for each other again because we are surrounded by such a cloud of witnesses. We become those witnesses for each other. And you can do this by adding these concerns of yours into the comment section on whatever platform it is that you found us. Now, I do hope that you're ready and that if you aren't, please go and grab what you need to celebrate communion. Because to prepare ourselves to celebrate communion in, in just a bit, I'm going to invite everyone to join in our prayers together. So friends, let's begin in prayer. Eternal God, I ask that you let your, let your Holy Spirit rest in power over us so that these earthly gifts of, of, of bread and cup may be an opportunity for us to share together in something that's bigger than ourselves. Let it become the communion of the body and, and the blood of Christ. 
Allow us to become one with him, one with each other, and set for the path that you have for us in this life. We ask that Jesus' coming and glory find us always watchful. Find us in prayer. Find us strong and, and, and being truthful and loving and peaceful and kind. We pray that you heal the divisions. Divisions in our communities, in our nation, and in all the world. And with your whole creation, we will sing your praise through your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask that you hear the calls and the prayers of your children offered up in the comments of this worship service for all who are worshiping. And carry grace, healing, and peace to all who suffer. We pause now to seal our prayers with the one that our Lord taught us as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You know, this meek table that is in front of us today, it's more just a sign. On a table that we're invited to at every point in our lives, a table where the very feast of the kingdom, all the expectations of what God has for the world sit right before us, and we are invited not only to join it, but to carry this to other people. To carry love, to carry peace, to carry grace. We find it all right here. On the very night that he was betrayed, our Lord sat at table with all of his disciples. And as he was sitting there, he took up a piece of the bread and having blessed it, he broke it. And he gave it to them saying, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. And in the very same way, he took up the cup. He held it before them saying, this is the new covenant, the new relationship that we have with God, our Father. Whenever you do this, do this in remembrance of me. The fact is right here before us. We have the very gifts of God given over for the people of God. It is Christ, not me, who beckons us forward, saying, take and eat. Do this in remembrance of him. This is the body of Christ, broken for you. Take it and eat it. And this is the cup of salvation offered for the sins of many. Drink it and remember the grace of your Lord. My friends, as we get ready to go back amongst all the normal of life, carry this with you. Know that you have been not only healed and sustained here by this meal, but challenged, charged by God to be sent out as a gift, as an offering for other people. Let your life speak most clearly and brightest when you stand along those who suffer. When you stand up for those who have been cast aside. And when you become the person others look to in their own lives. In the next week, Tom Court, our very own parish associate, will be inviting us to reflect on what really matters in, the, in this life. And even as we get ready and prepare for that, I, I hope that you will remember this week as, as we go out into the world that you are loved so much more than you could ever hope or imagine and that you'll be at peace 
Thanks, Ben.